Thank you very much. It's uh, real nice to be here. Uh, on my way back to Texas, I left Washington, and it really is a delight to be back in America. <laughs> and with people who think straight. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I try to uh, prepare myself, and I do a pretty good job of preparing myself in dealing with the people in Washington, but the truth is, if I stayed in Washington all the time, if I had to deal with only the mentality that exists in Washington, I wouldn't be able to do it. And fortunately, not only when I come to groups like this where there's essentially no question about where we stand on the proper role for government, even in the district uh, that I represent, for the most part, the average person there, certainly the average person that supports me, works for me, and votes for me, shares just about everything that we believe in. They're sick and tired of what's happening. So it is a real delight to be here and visiting with so many of you, and I thank so many of you for uh, all the, the help that I've received. If, uh, if, if an individual like myself try to make points uh, by running and getting elected and going to Washington, I can't do that as a single person. And most of you are very much aware of what happened uh, in 1995 and 96. It was a year and a half campaign. And uh, it was only with your help and your support from around the country uh, that made the difference. So uh, it, it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of fun. But the real fun was us winning and really getting an endorsement and saying that we do have enough people that believe in these issues and that they will vote for somebody who will stand on that. So I thank you very much. I would like to, uh, as we say in Washington, take, make a point of personal privilege and follow up on what Lou said about my family. Matter of fact, uh, I've kept a little bit of secret this morning from everybody because I thought I would tell everybody together. But it was very important uh, for my daughter that I try to be there when she had the twins. Now, my daughter is the, uh, number five. I have three kids that went through medical school. She's a senior in medical school. And uh, she uh, is in her senior year, and uh, she has twins, and she's in her ninth month. And uh, she has it planned. She, she did a very good job. As of uh, Monday, she will be off for two months. And, uh, and I thought the way it was working out that there was a very good chance that uh, her, her two babies would come uh, this weekend. And uh, this morning, uh, my wife called me and woke me up. It was at 7 o'clock. And she says, well, I just caught a call from Joy, and she's been admitted to the hospital, and uh, she's doing very well. And she says, I'm on my way to the hospital. And, uh, of course, you worry about anybody having a baby, but especially somebody in your own family, and especially if they're having twins. And if you know a little bit about medicine and you do deliver babies yourself, you know there's always a problem that could occur. Well, believe it or not, in 45 minutes, my daughter, my uh, older daughter called and said, they're both here. <laughs> them very healthy. My, my daughter is tall and slender, not a real big person. She delivered a six pound, five ounce boy and a six pound, four ounce girl. <laughs> so we, we were very blessed today and I, and I thank you for your support. <laughs> but um, as I said, it is a delight to uh, visit with you and visit about some of the problems that we face. And uh, Lou gave me the title talking about plunder in, in the 20th century. Well, that's a pretty easy topic because I think that's been the, the goal of uh, our government uh, systematically over this entire century because uh, they, they have certainly been doing a whole lot to undermine the uh, principles of liberty. Although we do not live in poverty and this country is still very wealthy, I believe where we have, uh, uh, we have undermined something even more important than literally taking away our wealth, which they do enough of that. And that, and, and that is systematically undermining that system that provides and, and produces wealth, uh, the market system. So in many ways, we are living off some of the wealth uh, that has been produced in the past, and we're, uh, as a government, we certainly live off uh, borrowing and uh, inflation, and so there's a lot of uh, uh, illusions that are going on. 
But in Washington, the mentality has improved. I would grant that to Lou that uh, we're, we certainly have more friends. I feel better than I did 12 years ago when I left that people are much, much more receptive to our views. But still, many members of Congress will come to me, more so than ever, will come and say, boy, I wish I could vote like you do, because I believe the way you do, but I don't think I could sell that in my district. And younger members will come and seriously ask me to explain issues because they said, you usually have a reason. One young man came up to me the other day and he said, uh, uh, why did you vote against that? And I explained that. He said, looks like you read almost all those bills. <laughs> 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 Somebody else the other day, we were sitting around talking, and uh, when they're really having trouble, uh, when the majority, the Republicans, have trouble moving things along, and the one thing I will concede, if your goal is to move things along, which quite frequently is not my goal, but if your goal is to keep government functioning, uh, it is a dilemma. The, uh, the margin is very narrow. I think it's 11 Republicans have to uh, defect and then you lose a vote. And we've lost uh, some good votes. There has been some good legislation proposed. And we would lose 35 of the liberal Republicans from the north, uh, northeast. But one day we were sitting around talking and gabbing, and they were very frustrated about, you know, the roadblocks being put uh, in the way by the Democrats and the moderate Republicans. And one guy says, he said, some days, he says, I wish we could be back in the minority. Then I could vote with Ron Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, he felt compelled that he had to vote for these appropriation bills. They feel very compelled to look like they're managing things well. The leadership in Washington for the last uh, year now has been operating on the assumption that the American people can't stand the thought that the government might be closed down again. And that when the government closed down for a few days, that, uh, that the, the American people rebelled against this. So they work on the whole assumption that they lost that PR fight and the American people are nearly hysterical that it might close down. I don't know about you, but I didn't mind that too much. <laughs> the um, time I was campaigning, they were actually, you know, it was the time they did close down the government. And even among people other than us, I never heard once a complaint about it. I mean, people were, were quite pleased or not worried or unconcerned or didn't even notice. <laughs> so, uh, but, but that's, that's the mentality they have because they get all their information essentially from inside the beltway. And I think that is a real serious problem. The other day when we were getting ready to leave for a break in August uh, and I was anxiously waiting to get on an airplane to uh, come back to Texas, uh, I was talking to uh, one of the leaders on the floor, and uh, he was saying, boy, he says, it's going to be great to go home, uh, you know, during this break. He says, I'm, I'm just looking forward to going home, sitting out on my porch, and fishing in the Potomac. <laughs> so going home to him, and he was a Texan, so he, going home to him was going to his house in Washington, and somebody else told me the other day, he said, it was so disturbing. He says, I was talking to so-and-so, and he's a, he's a safe incumbent, and they said, would you stay over uh, another day or two in the district and attend this meeting on Monday? He says, oh, I'd like to. He says, but i got to get home. And man, he had to go back to Washington. So they live there, they think that way, and they do not have the perceptions about what's happening. And I think that is probably one of the reasons why we did better than they ever anticipated that we could have done, you know, in this campaign. Because we did. I mean, we had just about everything thrown at us. So uh, your support and our hard work, I think, uh, uh, you know, deserves some attention because it wasn't an accident. The first time I was elected uh, in, the, in the 1970s, you might have said, well, it was a fluke. You know, they didn't know who he was. He was sneaking in the back door. He really wasn't just average. He was really somebody that was going to vote for the Constitution all the time. Not too long ago, one of my staffers came up to me. He says, we had a little conversation uh, with another staff person. He came up and he says, he says, your boss has this unusual approach to, uh, to uh, legislation. He looks at it every time in relationship to the Constitution, doesn't he? 
And uh, that, that seems so strange. And he said, yeah, that's the way he does it. <laughs> but uh, there was a piece of legislation on the floor the other day and uh, it had to do with the United Nations, which is an uh, interesting subject. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. But uh, during the debate, uh, 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 Bert Blummard's favorite uh, congresswoman, uh, uh, Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, was uh, on the floor and she was debating me. And, and uh, it, I was proposing that we strike all the funds... Uh, uh, for corporate welfare, overseas uh, governments, and for corporations, and <laughs> minor little things. So uh, the the debate went on, and she was given the justification. So I interrupted her and got permission to ask her questions. She said, "Yes." I said, "Could you tell me which part of the Constitution that you get this authority?" And she all of a sudden looked at, looked over. And she says. You know, I've never thought about that. <laughs> she says, that's a very interesting question. We should spend more time on issues like that. She says, but I don't know the answer to that. And she says, maybe one of my colleagues around here might be able to answer that for us. And I was just totally dumbfounded. So somebody got up and says, yes, I know. Uh, another Democrat got up and says, I know. It's in the general welfare clause. <laughs> I said, but this doesn't sound like general welfare. It sounds like that you're destroying this general welfare of the American taxpayer by taking more money from them and giving it to the specific benefit of some corporation or foreign government. I said, I don't think that's what the founders had in mind. So uh, and now more often uh, I, I uh, brought that uh, subject up on uh, on, high, on, on schools, they're, you know, proposing that we have national testing. And I was supporting an amendment that we shouldn't have it. But the amendment was really, on principle, not the greatest amendment in the world because it said, we, do, we oppose the president's scheme to have uh, national testing because of the ramifications. And, and, uh, and we cannot have national testing until the Congress approves it. So it was an argument. Who should set the test? The conservatives in the House or the liberals in the White House and let Hillary set the test, which is really establishes your curriculum. So I suggested to him that uh, I'm supporting this amendment. But to tell you the truth, I don't even think Congress should be writing any tests either. <laughs> So uh, they felt compelled uh, when they summarized uh, uh, their uh, reasons why they did not want to support this amendment. The Democrats did answer back uh, to me and said, let us assure you that this is very constitutional. It is the obligation of the government, you know, to take care of education. And under the general welfare clause, uh, we must uh, take care of the people, you know, that sort of thing. So hopefully we are able to do more of that, compel them to uh, defend on principle uh, what they are doing. We use, of course, the constitutional argument very often. One thing I want to do more so and more effectively is use a moral argument as well and uh, point to them who use force and authoritarianism to steal and rob instead of concentrating on the so-called and questionable benefits that they are providing. They must be made to think about and be responsible for the evil they cause by stealing from the people that have the, been the producers of the world. This past week you uh, heard a few things in the news that I think uh, are important happening in, uh, in Washington. One was the pay raise. Uh, that's very important stuff. And, uh, and, and I think you could guess my position on the pay raise. I'm not for the pay raise. I voted against the pay raise. And uh, I think that the uh, pension fund is atrocious. I do not participate in it because of it. I think if you, we, the people, would make sure they would get rid of that lucrative pension fund, you wouldn't need term limits. I mean, they would all leave and go back to work. <laughs> But anyway, there was something about that argument I didn't like. First off, uh, it, it, it was sneaky and tricky. The bill was brought up rapidly. We didn't know it was brought up under the, uh, uh, under the Treasury post office bill. It was brought up rapidly. And when you hear somebody say there was no pay raise in that bill, they're absolutely technically correct. Because in 1989, it was legislated that the members of Congress would get an automatic cost of living increase of, of one half percent lower than all other federal employees. 
You know, if we were really doing our job uh, and we had no inflation, we could let them have that, you know, because there would be no inflation and they would be doing their job. And we could even uh, talk about changing the pay, but those, those aren't the circumstances that, uh, that exist. So uh, all they did in that bill was delete the ordinary common yearly cancellation of the automatic pay raise. So there was nothing in the bill. You couldn't read anything about pay raise. It was just that they didn't cancel the automatic increase, which means that there will be a 2.3%. It comes out after taxes that a member of Congress will make $40 more per week. So, uh, I, I, like I say, I'm opposed to that and voted against it. But really, in many ways, the PR efforts there bothered me because there was a lot of talk about it at the very same time the bill was going through, there was an appropriation in that bill for two agencies of government that I would think that nobody in this room thinks even should exist. One, the IRS, and two, the BATF. <laughs> but what did they do? Did they try to live within their means or did they try to stay within the COLA and give each one of these organizations a 2.3 pay increase? No. What they did behind the scenes, they gave the IRS, in spite of all these grand and wonderful hearings, actually we're going to benefit from the hearings. There's, they, the phones are ringing off the roof up there. Uh, they're calling in like crazy, angry American citizens calling Congress, and that's great. So those hearings are wonderful. But at the same time you hear about, you, we see these hearings going on, what did they do for the budget of the IRS? They increased it by more than a half a billion dollars. How serious can they be? Talking through all, you know, talking all the time about IRS changes, flat taxes, and sales taxes, and all these things. At the same time, they're increasing the budget by over a half a billion dollars. I, I talked to those in leadership positions of the, those who put that in, and, they, and those who publicly are always making these grand statements. I said, but why? Why are you putting this half a billion? They need the money. They have management problems. They need more staff and they need better computers. That is the type of hypocrisy that does annoy me, let me tell you. And, uh, but I, I think the, the climate is better. I have to look for the positive things. I think we're moving in that direction. They're getting the message. The hearings are good. The TV programs now are starting to show the abuse. You know, in the long term, this is all going to benefit us. But on the short run... That gang up there is still doing what we don't want them to do. I mean, all we'd have to do is defund them and we would accomplish something. But all this money, I do not think, will cancel out the concerns. And some people would say not concern, but anticipate, hopeful anticipation that the whole system is going to blow up in the year 2000 anyway. And the computers won't work and the IRS will be out of business. <laughs> And on the BATF, they increased the BATF funding by 14%. The IRS was 8%. The uh, BATF was 14%. And in, in all reality, if we had a constitutional government, we would not have a BATF for sure. Uh, the gun laws are very important to me and to my constituents and to everybody who believes in the Constitution. And really, the only gun laws we ought to be pe passing are those of repeal. Repealing everything back to the 30s. The budget that was passed over my objection it was no reason to be encouraged. And yet all you heard was uh, euphoric statements coming from Washington saying, it is wonderful, the balanced budget is just about here. The only thing that they didn't tell you was they don't count what they borrow from all the trust funds. The national debt is currently going up at the rate of over $200 billion per year. And then they concede that there is going to be 30, 40, or 50. It's a t they consider it a total victory if the national debt is only increasing by a quarter trillion dollars. At the same time, by their recalculations and these wonderful uh, statistics that they're using, they said that the revenues are going to come flowing. There are no problems. The revenues are flowing. The deficit's going down. And therefore, we can give you a little bit of a tax cut, which they haven't done very much, and which I supported the tax cuts. But at the same time, 
What did it justify? It was to justify more welfare spending. So they introduced the whole notion of kid care and expanding of uh, socialized medicine to the tune of tens of billions of dollars. Of course, they'll say 40 billion, but you know Medicare started off at a couple billion and now it's hundreds of billions. And uh, that, that process is still in place. Matter of fact, I think it's in, in danger of expanding because uh, those conservatives who uh, have been most concerned about the way things are going have sort of conceded that there will be more money and they are looking up for more things to spend. Those, that, the group that were most outspokenly opposed to uh, the deficits and all the problems we have are anxiously waiting to support Schuster in expanding the amount of money uh, spent on, on the highway system. So that, um, that process is still alive and well, uh, but it will, reality will set in probably within the next year or so uh, once uh, the business cycle catch up with the political cycle. And the business cycle will, interest rates will not be fixed at these so-called low rates. Uh, spending will not stay where it is. And, uh, of course, revenues tend to go down uh, when, uh, when you go into a recession. So all those figures are going to change. I think that it will be within two years uh, that the concern about uh, balancing the budget will be not even mentioned. The concern will be how do we spend more and how do we inflate more to stimulate the economy. So I think that it will be a shift, uh, a, a sharp shift in attitude in the, in the not too uh, distant future. The um, idea of, uh, of plunder, I think, is, is one that... Uh, is very appropriate when you think of big government because that is essentially what government is all about. Uh, they plunder us by taking what they do not deserve to have. And uh, Shadaroff mentioned about, wrote about what the income tax really was when it first came into existence in 1913 and explained it very well, that it was a very, very dangerous type of tax because even though the tax might be at 1%, it establishes the notion once and for all that the government has that moral right to our lives and the fruits of our labor. So it was the establishment of the principle that was most important. And so therefore today, if uh, we offer a tax decrease in Washington, Without a blink of an eye, a liberal will get up and say, we cannot do that because government can't afford it. So giving you back your own money, allowing you to keep the fruits of your labor, allowing you to use your life as you please is a cost to government if they do not get what they want. But we're at a point now where government is uh, uh, taking from us more than half of what we earn. Uh, in spite of the apparent prosperity that we have, uh, there is a tremendous cost, a tremendous burden, and I believe that uh, the, the uh, productivity or at least the uh, standard of living remains relatively high for most of us because it's on borrowed money. And uh, many consumers borrow, many businesses borrow, many governments borrow, and therefore it is uh, based on borrowed money. But we work if we pay out of all our taxes and the cost of regulation. Ironically, we, have, we work until July 4th, and unfortunately, and incidentally, our first day of independence from the government tax man is on July 4th. Maybe that's why the American people are still sick and tired of what they hear from Washington. The people in Washington that gave out this wonderful message over the last uh, several uh, weeks or a month or so about how well the economy uh, was, was doing and is doing, uh, do not realize that if they would go home more often, if they didn't consider the Potomac River their home, if they would go home more often, it would not only be us who are in this room today, but it would be many, many average citizens who are not involved in political action and in educational action. And they realize that they, when I went home, the people either totally ignored it or if they heard it, they didn't believe it. And that is, I think, is a healthy sign. I think the American people have awakened. Hopefully our message is much stronger than they ever would believe. There was never a thought for a minute that they could, uh, the Republican Party could spend a million dollars and attack me on the most vulnerable position, which meant that I do not believe in and think we should totally get rid of the national war on drugs. They were firmly convinced 
that that would be the most vulnerable spot. The Republicans spent a million dollars on it, and we answered back and talked about taxes. We gave them the answers why the federal government shouldn't be doing it and all the dangers of our civil liberties and the reason they have war on drugs is really just an excuse to invade our financial privacy. Then answered back, we want lower taxes. We want lower taxes. We want less government. And we continue to do that, and that was a way to, that we got to victory in that primary race. But the Democrats didn't learn anything because they looked at it and said they just didn't make the story ugly enough. We got to tell everybody that he's going to give drugs to little babies and do all these horrible things. And they went and used the same issue. And hopefully we can see this as a sign that the average person is more sophisticated and more understanding and more willing to believe somebody with a different, uh, different explanation and be willing to vote against this establishment and this set of principles that they think are, are sacred. So I am, I am encouraged with that, and I am very grateful that I was able to deliver that message and then come out. Uh, it would have been discouraging, not for me personally, because I don't need to be in Washington, but it would have been personally discouraging. It would either be the message was wrong or I was the wrong messenger, and we wouldn't know, but we'd say, here it is, somebody finally ran with all these issues out on the table. It wasn't like in the 70s where it was, I was an average Republican. I have run as a libertarian. They know my positions. They know I will vote as I say. I, I, I say I will. And it was out on the table. And then they picked the ugliest uh, issues they could and distorted them. And still we were able to win. So this is a powerful message. It's very positive. And if and when the economy turns down, they will have to look more toward us for the answers. But we can't wait until that crisis hit. One of the motivations I've had is a personal motivation and decision. And even though this is, there's absolutely no scientific analysis to this because I admit I do not know, but I am anticipating that in the next several years, two, four, six, eight years, that we will have a major serious crisis financially, monetarily, and economically. And that if I wanted to participate in the debate, I believe very sincerely if our message and our issues had to be heard, I could do this a little bit better there than I could outside. Although all our efforts are necessary. When I wasn't in Congress, I did my very best through my foundation. An institute like the Mises Institute is critical for this. This institute provides the most sound economic positions of all the organizations in the country, we need more information like this in Washington. One of the most important things you can do as an individual, not only providing support for the candidates that you like and providing support for education, the other little thing you can do, it doesn't cost very much, that has a tremendous impact, more so than I ever dreamed, and that is call your congressman, write to your congressman, go see them. And you say, why bother? They don't listen. They don't change their vote. But even when they don't, it has become more noticeable than ever. They do know that I am not by myself, although I might be voting by myself frequently one thing so different right now, not only the results of the election that we could compete with the big guys, but when they go home, somebody will come up and say, why don't you vote more like Ron Paul? And it's not once or twice. It's maybe hundreds of times. Hopefully it'll be a thousand times. That is very, very helpful. Not in an argumentative way and all that. Just to say, uh, you know, just to try in a very serious manner, put your stamp of approval on what we're trying to do. And it can be uh, very, very helpful. Not too long ago, I had a conversation with a group of uh, Republicans very much in the know about what's happened up there for the last 15 or 20 years. And it was a most astounding conversation. And I am still shocked by the revelation, even though it's something we all knew about. And it has to do with taxation, it has to do with the IRS, and it has to do actually with uh, the, the current expansion of the IS, IRS uh, uh, budget. But we all know about supply-side economics. Now, there are some, some elements of supply-side economics that we can endorse. Lower taxes. Lower taxes. We should lower spending, but if they want to lower taxes, we're going to vote to lower taxes. I'm voting for lowering taxes no matter what.
that, that is easier. The other half of lowering spending is a, has a political risk, but nevertheless, I'm going to vote to lower spending no matter what. But in this conversation, uh, we were talking about the uh, Reagan years. The goal of supply-side economics is always to, uh, to raise revenues for the government. They don't lower taxes to lower spending, to lower regulations, to lower the, to shrink the size of government. Their goal has always been to explain that if you lower rates, revenues are going to go up. Well, the last thing we need are more revenues to go to Washington. They're liable to spend them. <laughs> if the revenues went up, we'd all be better off if we burned them. Because I think we always lose twice, once when they take it from us and once when they spend it. If they only took it and didn't spend it, we'd be a little bit better off. But best of all, we shouldn't even let them take it from us. But that's one half of supply-side economics. But this gentleman who was in the middle of the discussions in the early 80s with uh, Ronald Reagan and the uh, Democratic Congress um, made a, d a deliberate decision. And, and uh, this was almost like uh, right hand up. This is absolutely true. And I was all ears because I was incidental to the conversation. But it was a rehash of the 80s, and he was saying, you know, maybe we got off on the wrong track in the 1980s. And I suspected that uh, and made a few comments of that, and one of the reasons why I ran in 1988 as a libertarian. But nevertheless, he said, Ronald Reagan came to them and they said, we must lower tax rates, but we must increase revenues. Therefore, we need to give more money to the IRS because they had it calculated that if you gave a billion dollars to the IRS, they believed that with more aid and assistance, they could collect $17 billion. Now, that's a pretty good profit. 17 times the investment. That's the way they looked at it. But that was a deliberate policy that the administration agreed to with the Democratic Congress. Now, he was taking the position that that no longer exists, and that was not the goal of the, uh, of the federal government and the Republicans in Congress, but I disagree. He may believe, and they may believe they are not doing it the same way as they did it in the 1980s, but if you see that they're increasing a half a billion dollars, might not be as bad, but it's still pretty bad. I mean, they're still going in the wrong direction. We talk about tax reform. There is a movement to... Uh, have get rid of the, uh, the income tax and have a sales tax. And I have made two promises. Always vote to lower taxes and always do anything possible to reduce the arbitrary, unconstitutional power of the IRS. That we must do. <laughs> but quite frankly, I do not believe that we can be confident that if tomorrow we could do this and get rid of the income tax and turn it over to a sales tax, and all of a sudden things are going to be okay. I mean, you're going to have agents uh, collecting sales taxes. You still, you still have an income tax, which is an income that they call Social Security, and I don't see that as a different tax. Nobody dares talks about that, or, so, or uh, Medicare tax. So those taxes are there, and you still are going to have to protect. We're up to, what, 15 or 16 percent now. That'll go up to 20 in no time because they're always short money there. So you're going to have this income tax, which is not called an income tax. Then you're going to have a, a sales tax. And then others argue, no, what we do is simplify it, reduce the amount of time we spend on filling out our forms. We're going to have a flat tax. Well, all of these things, I guess the discussions are healthy. We should move in the direction of less taxes and less regulation. But the truth is nothing is going to happen until we ask the question and get an answer what the role of government ought to be. As long as the majority of the American people believe it's in their best interest for the role of government to manage a welfare state and police the world, I mean, what's the difference? They're still going to extract and plunder us by taking more and more as they have been. The problem is, is the taxes are so high they can't do it. And right now they have had a free ride for the last four or five years because foreign central banks have been quite willing to loan to us. And they have been monetizing our debt to a less extent than our own Fed. But it's also credit now is international. It creates a lot of liquidity. A lot of that flows back into our stock market. 
Very interesting things have happened in the past three months. There has been a downturn in the purchase of our foreign debt by foreign central banks, and also there has been a slight shrinkage of their holdings. Their holdings now are 200 and some million dollars above what our own Fed holds. So I think that we're on the verge of, of uh, seeing, uh, seeing a change in how our deficits are, are being financed. And that means that there will be more pressure on the dollar, there will be more pressure on interest rates going up. And uh, when that happens, I don't know, but I think eventually. Long term, I'm optimistic about the movement toward one world government and uh, world management of trade and all these things because I believe that uh, nationalism is still alive and well. I believe when the Japanese, uh, when it comes to push to shove uh, and other countries are hurt and they see the dollar on its way down and it's in their interest to sell dollars and they get a little bit frightened, I do not believe they'll say, we have to protect America's economy, we have to keep buying more dollars. I do not know, there's a lot of economists in here, a lot smarter than I am, but I don't know of any time in the history where you can run a negative trade balance for so many years and export your money and not eventually have to see some of that come back. And we saw those crises come. In 1971 and 1979, there was an attack on the dollar. And things are different now because we don't have a gold standard. So the adjustments aren't, aren't automatic and they're not as efficient. And then if there is a collusion for central banks to cooperate, then you just might see what I believe we have now is a bigger bubble than we've ever had before in, in the history of the world. And therefore, when the correction occurs, I think we will be able to look back and uh, look at what's happening in Japan. And I imagine what I anticipate is something like what happened in Japan with the uh, downsizing of their economy. At the same time, if it's worldwide and it's dollar-related, it's going to be many folds more significant than what is happening in Japan. Most Americans have, annoyed, have ignored what's happened in Japan and have been quite willing to continue with Japan bashing, as if Japan is causing the trouble of our imbalance of trade. It's the fact that we create dollars and we spend them overseas and there still is a trust in our dollar and, and our price levels aren't going up, uh, certain price levels. Some price levels are going up very rapidly. We have a lot of inflation. We have a huge bubble and uh, we have to deal with that. There is uh, one uh, other thing that uh, I have written about. It will be in my Freedom Report, but it's something that uh, I have been aware of, but not quite, I never quite comprehended the significance of what we do with our budget in Washington. came up this year when we were dealing with the uh, Overseas Private Investment Corporation. That operates by encouraging the American businessman to go overseas and invest in a politically and economically unsafe economy in order to get cheap labor. And we subsidize them. And then the insurance, which is taxpayers back, says that if, the, if that company fails, those companies can be bailed out for political and economic reasons. So it's an atrocious uh, uh, program that is designed to help large corporations as well as foreign uh, government. They came to us and they said, we need $32 million. And we said, well, why do you need this? Uh, we're against corporate welfare. And there are quite a few in Congress that will talk that way. And they said, well, this is not anything like that because the program is self-sufficient. They loan money out and money come back in. They pay premiums and it's self-sufficient. Well, then why do you need the $32 million? Well, this is just for the management part of it. <laughs> this doesn't have anything to do with the program itself. We don't need more money to, to loan out and run these programs. So this is just to run the program. So when I looked into their budget, I found out that uh, OPEC owns 2.1 or 2.4 billion dollars worth of non-marketable U.S. securities, just like what we give Social Security. And they hold these. And guess what? They earn interest. They earn interest. And they got last year 166 million dollars of interest by holding securities that were sort of held in trust, which were bought by taxpayers' money. So every year they buy a few more securities. Which means, what, what, what really does this mean? We give them 32 million, that got passed. We couldn't, I wanted to strike the whole thing and, and eliminate the program. Somebody else suggested we cut ten, a couple billion, million off, but both went down. Corporate, uh, the corporate uh, uh, lobbyists are very strong and very influential. And, um, the, if you add that together, the 166 plus 32, they are getting all this. This is an appropriation. This is a direct appropriation. It's called interest 
that everybody ignores. So what do we have? Well, then I got to thinking, well, I'm going to look into this. So I looked at all the agencies that we borrow. It's, uh, I think it's $1.9 trillion of our national debt is owed, you know, so-called to ourselves. It's uh, owed to Social Security and all these other agencies. And they're getting, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of so-called interest. But nobody addresses the subject of, uh, of, of uh, changing the interest. Everybody says interest payments are off limits. We have no control over it. But uh, the, the uh, agency, one of our favorite agencies, uh, I'm sure in this group, is the Federal Reserve. Uh, <laughs> of course, we could, uh, I guess we could live with abolishing that one too, don't you think? <laughs> but they, they hold $430 um, billion dollars of negotiable. They, they actually have a more legitimate uh, debt instrument where they buy and sell it in order for them to manipulate money and credit. But the monetary system, since it's corrupt, we do pay them interest to a large sum, hundreds of millions of dollars of interest, and that's where they get their appropriation. And they can spend uh, any way they want. But do we get to look at what they do and how much they get and how they spend it and what their policies are? No way. I'm on banking committee. I'm on domestic monetary policy subcommittee, and I do not have any oversight ability to find out what they're doing. So my suggestion uh, on this, uh, the honest budget would be to eliminate, to downsize our national debt by $2.4 trillion. Just wipe it off, and we'd have a smaller debt. You say, oh, that's great, we're going to save a lot of money. No, you wouldn't save money. Well, you might, but it would be more honest. And some people would get nervous because they would say, oh, you've just taken all that, all that debt away from Social Security. But those instruments, you realize, are dependent on future taxation and the younger generation. So, but if you did that, and you have to, what we do with uh, Social Security is, is you finance, everybody is financed, the checks go out based on the income. So it would be more honest, it would be direct taxation. And then, when OPIC and Export Import Bank and all these other agencies come, and they say, oh, we don't want 32, we want 210. That, to me, would be more honest. But, you know, uh, the significance of that really never hit me. And... Uh, it, and I, I, you know, try to keep up with this and think about it a lot, but it's, it's a big, it's a big issue. So um, I'm going to give that some more thought and uh, also be prodding them a bit because it certainly, I was certainly able to use that in the debate against OPEC and just ridicule them of saying that it's self-sufficient. You're getting, you know, all this other money and it's a big appropriation. So um, that, that is something that uh, we'll be continuing uh, to work on. The um, other issue that I've spent a lot of time on and probably will be pursuing is the issue of national sovereignty. You know, we have uh, the plunder of our own government uh, through the various mechanisms. Uh, and we know about uh, the tax plunder, and we certainly, in a, in a group like this, would understand the plunder through the inflation and how they steal the value of our money. Uh, that is something that is very poorly understood in Washington, and they do not understand how that works and how it's so unfair to middle class to the benefit of others uh, so often. But there, the, the fact that the regulatory agencies are doing the same thing as well, because if they make you spend more money and you're obligated to do certain things, this certainly consumes wealth and is another uh, area of plunder. But internationally, we have to face and will continue to face more of these problems because uh, this whole system is being internationalized. We should be encouraged when there is at least talk about delivering back to the states some of the control of some programs. I happen to think that's warmed over uh, revenue sharing and probably will not solve the problem. But at least they're talking about federal government doing less, states doing more, state responsibility. And that's sort of the cliche and the program of the conservative leadership in, in Washington. But uh, I think that's so dangerous because they do not address the issue on moral and constitutional principle. I mean, what good is a block grant to a state if you endorse the notion that you still should have uh, federal collections for housing, education, and for medicine, and you block grant it back and they have a little local management? Who knows? Maybe there'll be a little improvement in the management. That might be a danger. It might just prolong the agony uh, that much longer. So at least the thought, though, is in that direction. But what I'm fearful of is as we look at 
this return to some of this money and control to the state is we fail to see what's really happening, and that is so much of our power and authority and sovereignty is gravitating to international bodies. The World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations. I think that is probably one of the most serious things we face today. If we talk about national sovereignty, which I believe, as I said earlier, I'm optimistic that that is alive and well. I happen to believe that is very proper. I like to see uh, uh, the sovereignty of small governments and that people should voluntarily have their own uh, smallest government possible and that uh, people can live the way they want. But, in other, but uh, unfortunately, we're going in the other direction. President uh, Clinton gave a speech the other day at the United Nations. I just want to uh, make this point by reading a little bit about what he said. He was talking of the dawn of a new millennium and the new international arrangements necessary to, to take advantage of them. The forces of global integration are a great tide, inexorably wearing away the established order of things. But we must decide what will be left in its wake. Trade arrangements could create a protection web of institutions and arrangements. Be uh, about 165 votes uh, to not send the money, which wasn't, you know, a great victory. Uh, I mean, it was a nice number, but it's sad that we could lose it uh, uh, that easily. So. The majority are still wanting to send more money, and they believe in that system. I don't believe that's true with the American people. Not just with an audience like this. I, I never have to mince my words in my district. And they respond the way you do when I talk about this and talk about bringing our troops home and living within the Constitution and within a <clears throat> pro-American uh, foreign policy. <clears throat> But after the uh, vote I took, uh, that was the end of the day, and I took a five-minute special order yesterday <clears throat> to for further elaborate on that uh, particular vote. And I said, there's no secret in this uh, House, my position on the United Nations. My position is that we shouldn't be in it, and we shouldn't be sending them any money. But if you're going to have a United Nations, since I'm a, such a compromising sort, if we're going to have one, why don't we finance it just the way... Ted Turner wants to finance it through donations. <laughs> and I said, besides, if we have a volunteer at United Nations run by Ted Turners, if they go off and start another UN war, we can send Jane Fonda to fight the wars. <laughs> But I'm sure they think they're going to have only peacekeeping uh, missions. So uh, this, this trend toward uh, internationalism is, like I said, alive and well. We will be voting, I think, pretty soon on fast track. But fast track is having trouble, fortunately. We had a token vote last week of shifting $1 million from the uh, Commerce Administration over into a trade organization with the instruction that they spend this money uh, to investigate the effect of these international treaties on domestic businesses and some other things. It was far from a pure vote, but it was a healthy indication that the American people and the members of Congress were sick and tired of what was happening under some of these treaties. Some are protectionists, and they do it for the wrong reason, but others are sick and tired of the attack on our national sovereignty. But the Republican leadership quickly went to the floor. I heard nothing from the Democrats. They quickly went to the floor, and the president was opposed to this, and the leadership talked over and over again why this was very, a, a very dangerous vote. Fortunately, that vote came out much better. Those who did not want to transfer this $1 million only got 66 votes, which in a way, it's a mini vote about fast track. I just predict that they're very, very uncomfortable up in Washington right now about how smooth fast track is going to go through. But the concern that I have is not so much that maybe we can win on the short run and fast track doesn't get passed and we don't have the expansion of more international uh, government. It's the fact that they'll probably do it anyway. They'll have some uh, resolution. Some of, these, uh, some of these treaties that the president is now following when he sets up these biospheres, it's a treaty that we never even signed. He signed, but it was never even approved by the Senate. Yet the president takes it upon himself to follow all the rules of the treaty. So uh, they would not give up. That, that is a, it's a message. It shows that 
our side is, is growing. Uh, uh, unfortunately, they do not all endorse our free market views, but they endorse the idea that, uh, that there's, there's a limit. But this fast track, there's a certain portion of fast track that is worse than GAAP and worse than NAFTA. It has in it a, uh, a, a clause that will say that anybody who has a complaint, individually or corporate, do, does not have to go to the country involved to deal with their law. They go to the administrative body of NAFTA. And that it will then be override any state or federal law. The other thing that is drastically wrong with Fast Track is even if they were going to do good things, it's wrong to do it the way they're doing it. If we want low tariffs, if we want free trade, we should go to Mexico and say, look, we have an agreement. Neither country can have tariffs higher than 10%. And you could work that out in about a one page or one line. The colonies worked it out in about two and a half lines, free trade among the colonies. You don't need 22,000 pages of managed manage trade for the benefit of special interests. But this is, again, the, the very same thing. But this means that this government, right now NAFTA has a small element of this in, but this would massively introduce this principle that you could go around all domestic law. So I don't know what is going to happen on that, but I'm predicting that uh, Fast Track is going to have a lot of trouble, but that does not mean that we have won and that we should let our guard down. I think the, uh, as President Clinton uh, spoke in his speech to the United Nations, I think he is telling us exactly what he believes in and exactly the direction that they're going in. So we do have the IMF, we have the World Bank, and as the New York Times reported in a full-page ad, they were delighted with the World Trade Organization because uh, that was the third leg of the New World Order. And it was the last and permanent, you know, uh, important leg uh, in, in the New Order. But I am optimistic enough to believe that liberty lives and that national sovereignty still exists as when times get tough, this will be even more revived. The danger, of course, is that the nationalism comes out in an ugly form. It comes out in the form of a militant type of nationalism, of a type of fascism. That would be very dangerous. So there's nothing wrong to, with believing in America. There's nothing wrong with believing in the Constitution. There's nothing wrong with believing in the moral correctness of individual liberty. And there's nothing wrong with us defending and fighting for that. And we must do it. I mean, those should be our precise goals. But there is a great deal of danger if we do not fight and if we let our guard down and we allow these individuals to take away more of our liberties. The greatest plunder of the 20th century has been the plunder of our liberties. Today, we do have still a great deal of wealth. Most people are still doing well. People are not, even at this moment, people are feeling like there has been a recovery, although there's a large element out there that do not enjoy the benefits. But on the surface, at least, we still appear as a wealthy nation. But most of what we see and hear from in Washington do not come from people like you. It comes from people who want to plunder more. They come and they want more welfare benefits. And they want more food stamps and public housing and public education. That's what they want. But that is only half the story. The bigger story is the plunder by the bankers and the big corporations who want to guarantee that their investments overseas to seek cheap labor are protected by the hardworking Americans. I mean, that's, that's the problem that we face. The plunder continues. And yet, I believe underneath what we have done, is we have undermined the principles of liberty. What they have forgotten, certainly Ted Turner has forgotten, he has benefited from the fruits of a free market society and from a wealthy system. At the same time, he has no understanding and no respect for it, and he is then able to take his money and literally invest in the further destruction of the productive society. Our task in politics and in economic agitation should be to seek and enhance liberty. I don't see my role as any more complicated than that. I can defend it morally. I believe that we all have a right, a natural God-given right to our lives and our liberty. 
I believe that it's defended easily by the Constitution, that the General Welfare Clause did not mean that I should enslave you because somebody else needs or wants or demands something. We can defend it by the Constitution. And, more importantly for many, we can defend it, defend it from a practical viewpoint. And the practical viewpoint should be worked into the humanitarian viewpoint. Because humanitarian-wise, it is the only humanitarian system. Yes, the welfare state has produced a lot, and some people are doing okay. But it is coming to an end, just as the Soviet system came to an end, the welfare system is coming to an end. And if we believe in our fellow man and we want to have the system that is best, we do not try to help our fellow man by undermining the system, destroying liberty and stealing from our fellow man. That will destroy the very system that is the only humanitarian system, and that is one based on individual liberty. What is the purpose of liberty? The purpose of liberty is to seek for excellence and strive for virtue, to strive for economic uh, security, uh, religious uh, safety and security, and whatever, whatever our personal goals are. But if we allow the government to come in and decide our education and our religion and get involved in, in uh, the, so many things that they, they think they should be involved in, economic redistribution, and they believe that government's responsible for that, then I believe it's impossible. If we sacrifice the goal and the purpose of what liberty should be doing, and we as individuals do it in a voluntary society, if we give that job and chore to the government, then I think it is not difficult to obtain liberty. I think it's impossible to obtain liberty. So we have to set our goals. We are free. We are individuals. The goal of our activity is to seek and to protect our individual liberty at that, at that rate. And then uh, strive for these other goals. If we think we can solve our problems uh, through government coercion and force and plunder, even a little bit, even the 1% tax on our income is the opening crack in the door of an expansive government that we are witnessing now. So what I am saying, in spite of the great prosperity that we have, we are going to further witness the disintegration of the welfare state because we can't afford it. This country will go through a bankruptcy. And that is our job. That is our purpose. That is the goal of the Mises Institute and all of you to do whatever you can whether it's helping in a campaign or helping the Mises Institute or calling your congressman, the whole goal should be to show the fraud with which we have been placed under for all these decades. And when the time comes, our message has to be heard. I don't go to Washington with the idea that I can give a great speech. They don't even pay attention to me that much. And I'm not going to convert them and they're not going to all of a sudden next year uh, vote the majority to get out of the U.N., but I do believe that the message is very, very important. And we need more help. We need more help. There's a lot of people speaking our language in Washington. But unfortunately, when push comes to shove, they aren't quite as willing to take a, what they think is a political risk. Let's make it so that the political risk is not voting for liberty.